With the electrical components that we've covered so far in this course, voltage sources, current sources, resistors, and potentiometers, there's not a lot of stuff you could do with your circuits. For example, with a voltage source, you can light a light bulb or maybe turn a motor. A resistor gives you a little more flexibility. Putting a resistor in a circuit with a battery and a light bulb, for example, gives you the option to dim the light bulb a little bit by resisting the current. You can also put resistors with a battery in order to lower the voltage. For example, lowering a 9-volt battery to 5 volts or 3 volts or something like that using voltage division. Potentiometers give us a little more flexibility. With a potentiometer, you can have a circuit that you can change on the fly. For example, a battery and a potentiometer and a light bulb allows you to dim the light bulb. Likewise, a potentiometer can be used to give you volume control in a circuit. But the bottom line is that with the components we've learned so far, we're very limited in what we can do. That is going to change greatly in this next set of notes on operational amplifiers. We're going to see that with operational amplifiers, which we're going to cover in this set of notes, we're going to greatly increase the types of circuits that we can build and the usefulness of these circuits. With operational amplifiers, we're going to see that you can amplify a signal. We're going to see that you can add two signals together. We're going to see that you can add DC offsets to signals. We're going to see that you can integrate signals or take derivatives of signals, etc. We're going to see through this packet that once we introduce the operational amplifier, there's a lot more interesting things that we can do with our circuits. You want to read chapter 5 in the book. We're not going to cover things in quite the same order that they cover things in the book, but nevertheless, I think it's important to read the book to understand operational amplifiers. Warning about operational amplifiers. This topic is going to seem very difficult at first. The first few pages in particular might be very, very confusing. I assure you though, as we go through this packet of notes and as you do the lab, you will find that operational amplifiers are not difficult to work with and they're actually extremely interesting, extremely versatile devices. So don't get scared after the first few pages of notes when you think that things are getting very, very difficult and confusing. So let's start taking a look at the operational amplifier. First off, we will often abbreviate operational amplifier by the term op-amp. So I'm going to use the term op-amp a lot in this course rather than operational amplifier. Okay, so what is the op-amp? First off, the op-amp, like a potentiometer, is a three-terminal circuit element. Unlike resistors, voltage sources, and current sources that are two-terminal devices, op-amps are three-terminal devices. There are going to be two input terminals and one output terminal. Technically, the statement is not quite right. There are really five terminals. In addition to the two input and the one output terminals, there are two power supply terminals. The op-amp is an integrated circuit, or an IC, so it needs to be powered externally by plus or minus power supply voltages, typically plus or minus 15 volts. But when we talk about the op-amp, we often suppress those two power supply terminals and just call it a three-terminal device. Schematic representation of an op-amp is going to be a triangle. Once again, with two input terminals. One input is called the inverting input or the V minus input. The other one is a non-inverting input or the V plus terminal. The V minus terminal, some books will call V sub N. The non-inverting input, the V plus terminal, some books might call V sub P. The output terminal we call V naught. So those are our three terminals, two input terminals, one output terminals. And as I said before, because this is an integrated circuit, it's always going to be powered by a power supply. And we label those as plus VCC and negative VEE. And normally, those are going to be plus or minus 15 volts, but it doesn't have to be. They could be plus or minus 5 volts, plus or minus 10 volts. In fact, there are some op amps that are what we call single-ended, where it only has one power supply rather than two. But normally, it's going to be plus or minus 15 volts. Important comment here is very often we suppress the power supply connections on the schematics, and that's why we end up with three terminals. Just the inverting terminal, the non-inverting terminal, and the output terminal. As I mentioned before, op-amps are typically packaged in an 8-pin integrated circuit, which contains two op-amps. So for example, in our lab, we're going to use the National Semiconductor LF412 dual op-amp package. How are the eight pins assigned? Well, pins two and three are the inverting and non-inverting terminals respectively of op-amp A as we call it. And pin one is the output terminal for op-amp A. 
Terminal 6 and 5 are the inverting and non-inverting input terminals of op amp B, and the output is going to be pin 7. The two op amps in the IC share a power supply connection, VCC connected to pin 8 and VEE connected to pin 4. So what exactly does this op amp do? In simplest terms, an op amp is a voltage controlled voltage source. You can think of an op amp as a magnifying glass. It takes the difference between the two input terminals, V plus minus V minus, the non-inverting input minus the inverting input, the difference between those two voltages gets multiplied by a very large number A to give us the output voltage. So V output is A times V plus minus V minus, and A is going to be a very large number, 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 7th typically. In other words, this is a voltage controlled voltage source. We're going to see that actually an op amp is much more complicated than that, but that's sort of the beginning point is this voltage controlled voltage source aspect of it. The reason it's called an operational amplifier is that in the very early days of an op amp, they were used in analog computers to do different mathematical operations, adding, subtracting, integrating, taking derivatives, etc. In fact, we're going to see that even today, op amps are used a lot for adding and subtracting and multiplying different signals together. Next page is going to scare you. The figure on the left is a simplified schematic of the LF412 op amp. So once again, the LF412 op amp is a three or five terminal device, depending upon whether you count the VCC and VEE or not. So the simplified diagram on the left, which consists of MOSFET transistors and BJT transistors and a couple diodes, capacitors, resistors, etc., has our two input terminals. Here's our inverting terminal. Here's our non-inverting input terminal. Our output terminal is right here, and our power supplies are here and here. So there are the five terminals on this five terminal device, or three terminals, if you just want to count these three, on this three terminal device. That is a simplified schematic. On the right is a more detailed schematic. It still has the same five terminals. There are our two inputs. There's our output over here, and here are our two power supply connections. In EE310 follow-up electronics course, you'll learn a little bit more about the insides of the op amp. Fortunately, in EE210, we're not going to worry about this page at all. So I'm just showing this to show you how complicated the insides of that op amp circuit actually is. But once again, we're not going to worry about the makeup of the op amp in this course. We're just going to worry about how to use the op amp to make useful circuits. So let's look a little bit more at the input-output voltage relationship of the op amp. And we're going to talk first off about what we're calling open loop configuration. We're going to see in a minute that in general we use op amps in what's called a closed loop configuration. But to understand closed loop configuration, we first need to talk about the open loop configuration. So let's say we have an op amp and we're going to connect to the input a voltage source between the non-inverting and the inverting terminal. And of course, we want to measure the voltage at the output. Notice I am suppressing the power supplies here. So if you want to be more precise, you would power it by plus 15 and minus 15 volts. So as I said, the op amp is a voltage controlled voltage source. So V out is going to be some number A, some very large number A times V in, where V in is the difference between the non-inverting input terminal and the inverting input terminal. If you were to plot this on a V in, V out plot, so we have V in on the X axis, V out on the Y axis, you're going to get a straight line with the slope equal to A. So for example, if the input was 0.1 millivolts, 0 0.1 millivolts, and suppose A, suppose A was 10 to the fifth, 0.1 millivolt multiplied by 10 to the fifth would give you 10 volts at the output. And so once again, this op amp, you can think of it as a magnifying glass. It takes a very small difference between two voltages and amplifies it to a very large number. Important point here is the terms linear region and saturation region. You can't get something for nothing. You cannot, for example, 
take an op amp powered by plus or minus 15 volts, put one volt across the two input terminals, and get 100,000 volts at the output. You can never get more voltage than what you're powering the op amp with. And that's what this linear region and saturation region means. So we're operating in the linear region only up to the point where the output voltage equals the power supply values. So for powering it with plus or minus 15 volts, for example, VCC and minus VEE, we're going to see that eventually we get to a point where we do not get any more increase in the output voltage. We call that the saturation region. Once again, once the output reaches the power supply value, it levels off and cannot go beyond that at all. Actually, it's going to be a little bit less than that. We call that the saturation voltage. So if it's being powered by, let's say, plus or minus 15 volts, the saturation voltage might be plus or minus 14.5 volts. So if the input is in a range so that the output is going to be less than VCC, we call that the linear region. If the input is in a range such that the output gets saturated, we call that the saturation region. The difference between the power supply and the saturation voltage is called the headroom. The headroom might be a tenth of a volt, two tenths of a volt, it might even be a couple volts. It varies from op amp to op amp. But once again, the saturation voltage is going to be close to the power supply voltage. You never get something for nothing. If you're powering the op amp with plus or minus 15 volts, you're not going to get greater than 15 volts at the output of the op amp. What we're going to see is for the most part, we want to operate in this linear region. We want to avoid the saturation regions. There is an exception. We are going to look at a circuit called a comparator circuit where you do want to operate an op amp in the saturation region. But normally you want to operate it in a linear region. So it seems that this open loop voltage gain A, this term A, this slope here, is a very important term because it's going to dictate what the op amp does, or so it would seem. But there are a couple caveats regarding this open loop voltage gain A. First off, it can vary from op amp to op amp. So if you take two LF412 op amps in your parts kit, for example, and measure the open loop voltage, you're going to see that it might vary from op amp to op amp. So that means the two op amps, even if it's the same make and model, can have different values of A. The other thing you're going to see is that the value of A can vary within a given op amp depending upon operating conditions. For example, the temperature or slight changes in the power supply voltage can affect the open loop voltage gain A. So the actual value varies based on those things. Finally, we're going to see that the open loop voltage gain A depends upon the frequency of the input signal. The higher frequency the input signal is, the lower A is going to be. So we see that this value A, even though it seems like it's a very important term, has lots of problems because it changes. It changes from op amp to op amp. It might change from day to day. It might change even based upon the input signal. Let me show an example with this variation based on frequency on the next page here. So on the left here, we have our V ins. On the right, we have our V outs. I should point out that we have different scales here. The input voltages are in millivolts, the output voltages are in volts. Let's say that the input is a low frequency. So the signal on the left is a low frequency sinusoid. And let's say that A is going to be 10 to the fifth. So an input of 0.1 millivolt amplitude is going to give us a 10 volt output amplitude. So this signal here is an amplified version of the signal here. Let's say that at a higher frequency, the gain is only 10 to the fourth. As I mentioned on the previous page, A can vary with frequency and it tends to roll off at higher frequencies. So if you have a higher frequency input, you still get amplification, but now a 0.1 millivolt input would give us an output of only one volt. Now, this doesn't even look like it's amplifying. The output looks smaller than the input. But once again, remember, we're looking at different scales, volts and millivolts. So we're still getting an amplification. It's just not getting amplified as much as the low frequency signal above. So what happens then if the input is consistent of both the low frequency component, this variation like this, 
and then a high frequency component riding on top of it. What happens here, the low frequency component gets amplified in this case by 10 to the fifth, the higher frequency component gets amplified only by 10 to the fourth, and what we get is what we call magnitude distortion. What do we mean by magnitude distortion? If you look at these first graphs here, the graph on the right is an amplified version of the second graph. If you look at these graphs here, the graph on the right is an amplified version of the graph on the left. Once again, it doesn't look amplified, but it is. If you look on the third case, however, the figure on the right is not an amplified version of the circuit on the left. It's not the same shape. Notice the low frequency variation is much more pronounced than the high frequency variation at the output. We call that magnitude distortion, and that is a bad thing. If this open loop gain A varies from op amp to op amp, if it varies from day to day, if it varies from frequency and can cause things such as magnitude distortion, how can these op amps be useful? The answer to that is because we're not going to worry about open loop gain. We're going to see that most of the time we're going to use the op amps in what's called a closed loop configuration using something called feedback. And by doing that, the open loop gain is not going to matter. All that matters is that it is a large number. The exact value of A is not going to matter, as we're going to see in the next few pages. So in practice, we're going to use op amps in what we call closed loop feedback. Why do we do that? As I mentioned, some problems with an open loop configuration is the open loop gain A varies from device to device. It's frequency dependent. It's affected by the temperature, humidity, things like that. Another big thing is you have no control over the open loop gain. You get an op amp from the manufacturer, it's 10 to the fifth, 1.2 times 10 to the fifth, 2.5 times 10 to the fifth, whatever, you have no control over that. Very often you want to have control over what this gain will be. What we're going to see is that by designing a feedback network, that's a bunch of resistors and capacitors and inductors and other electronics that are put external to the op amp, connecting the input to the output and what we call closing the loop around the op amp, we're going to get a closed loop configuration that gives us a couple desirable results. First off, it's going to give us what we call a closed loop gain, G, that is not only predictable, it can also be chosen by the circuit designer. It's also constant over a wider frequency range, so you don't get variations like we saw on this page here. And then the other thing we're going to see is that we get an increased dynamic range of the input signal. What do I mean by that? Going back to this input-output configuration, because the open loop gain is so large, this linear region is going to be very, very small. It might be, for example, maybe negative 0.15 millivolts to plus 0.15 millivolts. Anything bigger than that is going to cause saturation. So you don't have a very big range of the input voltage that you can handle without hitting saturation. We call that dynamic range. And we're going to see that by using closed loop feedback, we get a much wider dynamic range. Final advantage is we're going to see that when we use an op amp in this closed loop configuration, we're going to have something called an ideal op amp model that's going to make our analysis much, much easier. We're not there yet, but we're going to get there soon. So let's talk about this feedback a little bit more. Most useful op amp circuits are going to use some external electronic components in conjunction with the op amp to give us what we want. For example, you may take a resistor and feed it back from the V-out terminal back to the inverting input terminal, the V-minus terminal. Remember, this terminal is V-minus, and this terminal is V-plus. We call that a feedback resistor. We call this negative feedback specifically because we're feeding back the output to the inverting terminal. And that's almost always going to be the case. We almost always do our feedback from the output back to the inverting terminal to create negative feedback. If you fed your output resistor back to the non-inverting terminal, it would be called positive feedback, but that does not give us useful circuits. So we're going to see that almost every feedback we're going to use in this class is going to be negative feedback. What's going to change is what we put in this feedback path.
We're going to start with simple things such as resistors, but later on we'll see what happens when we put capacitors, inductors, or potentiometers in that feedback path. Anyway, this particular configuration is called an inverting amplifier. It consists of an input signal, V in, connected through one resistor to the inverting terminal, a second resistor going from the inverting terminal back to the output terminal, and the non-inverting terminal is going to be grounded. So we're going to study this circuit and other similar circuits later on, and we're going to call these canonical amplifier models. Basically, we're going to come up with these models for basic op-amp circuits that vary slightly in what you put in the feedback and where you put the different feedback components. And once again, the one here is the most basic one, the inverting amplifier, which is the one we're going to look at first. Before we look at the inverting amplifier, we need to think about what model we're going to use for the op-amp. As we saw already, an op-amp is a voltage-controlled voltage source. One model for the op-amp is what we call the standard behavioral circuit model. Basically, we're going to replace the op-amp by a voltage-controlled voltage source. If you think about it, what we say with the op-amp, we say that V out is equal to what? Some large number A times the difference between the non-inverting and the inverting input. So we can model that mathematically as a voltage-controlled voltage source, where the output is going to be A times the difference between the two input terminals, the non-inverting and the inverting. A couple other things that are part of the standard behavioral model. One is this input resistance R in. We're going to see in practice that the current flowing into these terminals is going to be very, very small. So R in, as it turns out, is a very large number. The other thing we're going to see is that the voltage available at the terminals of the op amp are going to be slightly less than the voltage actually created internally by the op amp, which means that you're going to have an internal resistance with a voltage drop across it. We're going to call this R out, and it's going to be very small. So we see in the standard behavioral model, it's a voltage controlled voltage source plus two resistances, a very large input resistance and a very, very small output resistance. So how big is big and how small is small? So the input resistance could be in the giga ohm or tera ohm range, and maybe it could be as small as in the mega ohm range. But the bottom line is R in is going to be very, very large, which once again, meaning that these currents are going to be very small. So what about the output resistance? The output resistance is going to be very, very small. It might be 1 ohm, maybe tens of ohms, maybe up to 100 or 200 ohms. But the bottom line is R out is going to be very, very small. Let's see what happens now if we take the standard behavioral model and apply it to something like this basic inverting amplifier. What we're going to see is going to scare you. But once again, don't be afraid because we will find easier ways to do things. But I just want to show you what happens when you try to apply the standard behavioral model. So our first example is going to be inverting amplifier. So as I said, with an inverting amplifier, you have an input signal V in. It's fed through a resistor, let's call it R1, to the inverting terminal. A second resistor, R2, our feedback resistor, connects the inverting terminal to the output terminal. And finally, we have the non-inverting terminal that is grounded. And once again, cannot forget these two power supplies that we often do not show, plus or minus 15 volts. You don't want to forget that we're actually powering this op amp by an external voltage source. But once again, we often don't draw those on the circuit diagrams. So this is a schematic of an inverting amplifier. What we want to see now is what's the relationship between the output voltage and the input voltage. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace the op amp, this blue triangle here with its standard behavioral model on this page here. So basically, if we do that, we're connecting. So this point is there. This point is there. This point is there. And then we have ground. So basically, we're replacing the op amp by everything in this dotted red line. We get the standard behavioral model. And remember, this R out is going to be a small number, and this R in is going to be a large number. 
So let's try to analyze this circuit. It actually does not look all that complicated, but let's try to analyze it. And we're going to see that even though the circuit does not look complicated, it actually is. If using nodal or mesh analysis, you try to find an expression for V out in terms of V in, you would see it is horrendous. You can look in the book. In our current book, it's page 160 of the book. The only difference is they use the resistance RF instead of R2, and they use the resistance RS instead of R1. But if you do the analysis, which is shown in the book on page 160, you get a, a horrendous equation for what we call the gain of this op amp. The gain of the op amp, and we're going to use the letter G because this is a closed loop gain. Closed loop gain is defined as the output voltage divided by the input voltage. And we're going to see that it's a function of what? It's a function of A, so A shows up multiple places in this expression. It's a function of the internal resistances R in and R out. So R in shows up there, R out shows up there, there and there. It's also a function of these external resistors, R1 and R2. R1 shows up there and there and there and there and there. R2 shows up these other places. So what we see is that the open loop gain A, the internal input resistance R in, the internal output resistance R out, and the two external resistances, R1 and R2, all affect the closed loop gain G. All I can say about this expression here is yikes. This is pretty complicated. What I'm going to do is to develop a simplified version of this expression, and we're going to see that even the simplified version is very difficult. Look at the same circuit here, and let's make two assumptions. Let's assume that R in, which would have been here, is infinity. We said that if it's very large, let's make it infinity, so we're going to ignore it. Likewise, R out, which is normally here, we said is very small, we're going to make it zero. So the idea here is we want to simplify the circuit a little bit to try to come up with a slightly simpler version of this expression here. And we're going to see that the analysis is still difficult even with the simplification. So let's do this analysis. Let's start by doing KCL at the V minus node. We want to add this current plus this current plus this current equals zero. So KCL at the V minus node. Current to the left is what? The voltage at the coming from point, V minus, minus the voltage at the going to point, that's V in, over this external resistance, R1. Current to the right, normally it'd be V minus minus V plus over R in, but since R in is infinity, it's going to be zero. The current going up is what? V minus minus V out over R2 is equal to zero. But we can make a substitution. What do we know about V out? We know that V out is equal to A times V plus minus V minus. V plus is grounded. So V plus is zero. So this term becomes negative A times V minus. So solving for V minus, we get V minus is equal to minus V out over A. So let's now plug this back into here and here, and let's move V into the other side and solve this. We get what? Minus V out over AR1, that's this term, minus V out over AR2, that's this term, minus V out over R2, that's this term, equals, bringing that to the other side, V in over R1. So let's factor out negative V out. We get minus V out times what? 1 over AR1 plus 1 over AR2 
plus 1 over r2 is equal to v in over r1. Could simplify that by getting a common denominator here, here, and here. Let's also put the minus sign on the other side. We get v out times r2 plus r1 plus a r1 all over a r1 r2. That's getting a common denominator equals what? Minus v in over r1. We could then re-express this as v out over v in. So v out over v in, which by definition is our closed loop gain g, is equal to what? It's minus a r2 over r2 plus a plus 1 times r1. What we did here is notice that this r1 cancels with that one. So we see that by getting rid of r in by setting it equal to infinity and r out setting it equal to zero, we've simplified the closed loop gain a little bit from this horrendous expression here to this expression down here, which is slightly less horrendous. But let's go a further step, and this is where it gets interesting. Let's do a further simplification. We already saw that a is a very, very large number, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th. Let's assume that it equals infinity. So what do we have from before? We have the closed loop gain g, which by definition is the output voltage over the input voltage was what? Minus a r2 over r2 plus a plus 1 times r1. Let's divide everything by a. So we get minus r2 over r2 over a plus r1 plus r1 over a. If our open loop gain a is much, much greater than r1 and r2, what do we get? We get that this term is approximately equal to 0. And we get that this term is approximately equal to 0. So once again, as long as a is a very, very large number, which it is, as long as it's much larger than these external resistors r1 and r2, we can basically ignore those two terms here. So that means that the closed loop gain g, which once again is the output voltage over the input voltage, is approximately equal to negative r2 over r1. And this is the important result here. What we see is when we have an inverting amplifier, where the non-inverting terminal is grounded, the inverting terminal is connected to the output through resistor R2, and then connected to an input signal through another resistor R1, which is what we call our inverting amplifier. The output voltage measured versus ground is approximately equal to negative R2 over R1 times the input voltage. Couple things to note about this expression here. For all intents and purposes, the closed loop gain G is independent of the open loop gain A. Also, it's independent of the input resistance of the op amp and the output resistance of the op amp. Therefore, it's going to be immune to variations in the value of the open loop gain A. Remember, we said that one of the problems with the open loop gain A is that it varied greatly from op amp to op amp, from signal to signal, and even from variations in temperatures. So by closing the loop, we can basically ignore the exact value of A. All that's important is that it's a large number, and we get a gain that's independent of that. Even more important is this closed loop gain G is something that we control. We determine what these external resistors R2 and R1 are, so we can determine what gain we want. These problems associated with the open loop configuration of an op amp are solved by using the op amp in a closed loop configuration instead. So at this point, you might feel a little overwhelmed with op amps, and that's understandable. As I mentioned, to get to a point where we can understand and use op amps effectively, we need to go through this earlier material to try to see where things come from.
what we're going to find in the next class is that there are much easier simplifications that we're going to use for solving op amp circuits. But at this point, what you want to understand is that in open loop mode, an op amp is sort of unpredictable because of the variations in A. So we're going to use closed loop mode. In closed loop mode, if you use the standard behavioral model, as we did here, you get a very unwieldy expression for the closed loop gain G. But we're going to see that by ignoring R in because it's very, very large, by ignoring R out because it's very, very small, and ignoring A because it's very, very large, we end up with an expression that is actually very simple. So at this point, the only thing you really need to know is that the closed loop gain G in an inverting amplifier is negative R2 over R1. The rest of the stuff we covered sort of got us to that point, and it's important to understand that it's there, but what we're going to see in our next class is we're going to use just this simplified equation to solve our circuits. Have a good day.